Hey there book lovers and welcome to my channel. In today's video I'll be diving into the book called Landscapes by Christina Lai. I'd say right away that I didn't like this book and yet I still want to talk about it. You might ask why did I pick it up in the first place? Well, it's simple. It was our first pick for the summer reading group that I joined. Our reading list is full of our reading list is full of newly published works. Some of them are still in pre-order state. Anyway, let's get back to landscapes. Yeah, before we dive in, a couple of quick notes. First one, I'll mark this section of the video that has spoilers in it. So if you don't want to catch any spoilers, skip that part. And if you're watching this video after reading the book and you want to know my thoughts about it, then feel free to check that section as well. I'll leave the timestamps in the description below. And the second one is that all the things I'm going to talk about today is my perception and my personal opinion, and it might differ from yours, and that's totally okay. Let's start with some general information about the book. So Christina Lai grew up in Canada, and she currently lives there. She lived for some time in England during her graduate studies. She holds a PhD in literature from University College London. Landscapes were written over several years. In the book, the author reflects on the themes like art, memory, and environmental decay. All those topics intersect throughout the novel. How do you approach a new book? Do you make a research about the author, read reviews, or maybe watch interviews about it? Well, I personally prefer to go in blind. I don't read descriptions, blurbs, or, or introductions that aren't written by the author, because they usually contain some spoilers, and I prefer to discover the story myself. Though in the case of landscapes, I did look at the back of my hardcover, and I read the description, but it didn't stick with me. So that left me guessing a lot while reading, and maybe that was a mistake. If I had known what to focus on from the beginning, maybe I would have had a better opinion about the book. It took a while for the hardcover copy to arrive, so I started reading it in a digital format. During the first reading session, I read about 10 pages and ended up with about 3 pages of notes. I thought I wouldn't make it to the deadline at that pace. When the hardcover finally arrived, I was pleasantly surprised by its quality. Even though I didn't like the story, it didn't grab me, but the physical presentation is pretty impressive. Quality of the paper, the print, the layout, it's really nice. As I just mentioned, I ended up having a lot of notes while reading this book. I jotted down quotes, ideas, and questions that pop into my head. It felt like I was having a dialogue with myself, with the narrator, with the author, with the characters, with the book. Um, in total, I forgot to take my notebook. Anyway, in total, I wrote about 50 pages of notes. This approach significantly slowed me down, but that's how I want to read the books from now on. By diving deeply into them and trying to understand the reasons behind the author's choices. The book is set in the near future England that is affected by a disaster. The book resembles some features of the English country house novel. Think of Downton Abbey or Agatha Christie's adaptations. The primary setting of this book is a large estate called Mornington Hall. Despite crumbling, it acts as a character with its architecture, history, and a vast collection of art and artifacts. The brothers Aidan and Julian come from an upper class, unlike our main character, who is also one of the narrators, Penelope, Penny, who comes from a different social group. And at some point, she's writing about herself like this. I sometimes wonder what Turner, the son of a barber, felt when he first stepped into Mornington. I wonder if he felt the same sense of unease that I, the daughter of a gardener, felt, still feel, when I came to this seat of opulence, the opulence that would not have allowed room for someone like me. 
She's an art historian and works as a librarian and archivist in Mornington Hall. She's cataloging the remaining pieces of the vast collection that was partially sold to cover the repair costs for the estate. Penelope's experiences echo those of Penelope from Homer's Odyssey. She's portrayed as someone who waits and endures. I haven't read Odyssey yet, but I keep seeing references and mentioned of it in different books. This made me question why certain stories are so widely referenced. Why this link between different stories is so much needed. Is it just a literary tradition to make a link between a contemporary work and a well-known story? Or does this continuous reinterpretation keep the old stories alive and relevant to the contemporary audience? Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Instead of weaving and unraveling the shroud, Penelope in landscapes writes and archives. This writing serves as a tool of reclaiming her present and healing her past traumas. Except for reference to Odyssey, I've got a whiff of similarity with another book. Mostly first-person narration in the form of a diary with the vastness and ruination of the house reminded me of Piranesi, which I read last year and liked it. There are several layers of narration in this book. The first one is diary entries, written and narrated by Penelope. The second layer is also diary notes, but it's written in a third person and we can't for sure know who is the narrator in that case. Possibly also Penelope. And the third layer includes art criticism essays. Those essays are linked with the situations that Penny is living through, even though the situation itself happened several decades ago. The complete list of art references can also be found at the very end of the book, at the last pages. At times the prose felt overly florid. As I recently learned, it's called purple prose. This kind of writing is categorized by extravagant language, unnecessary adjectives, and heavy use of the metaphors and similes, prioritizing style over clarity. There are some things that I definitely like in books. One of them is when they mention familiar places, reference familiar books or movies. Within the books that were catalogued by Penny, there was one like that, a companion book to the exhibition at the House der Kulturen der Welt in Berlin. The moment I read about it, the picture of the building popped up in my mind. All right, spoilers territory starts here, and now I will continue with more details, thoughts, and spoilers. I was expecting so much more from the ending and from the story itself, but let's go step by step. The first secret that is shared with us to buy our attachment are those flowers that are growing next to the broken pipe. The luxury of having this broken pipe seemed either very irresponsible or extremely hopeful. I saw it as a sign that maybe she believes that one day things will return to normal or at least they'll, they will get better. You know how people sometimes do things because that's their only chance to do it. Otherwise they will just regret it later. And that's how I felt about the situation. I was trying to stay hopeful and optimistic. And with that hopefulness in mind, um, I will read a quote. It made me think of Gaudi houses in Barcelona, how nature is weaved into the interiors of them. Let me read it. In the 19th century, I later learned, Mornington Hall was famed for its seamless transition from interior to exterior, so that the man-made and the natural were interlaced in complete harmony. But then when I read about the house that is supposed to be demolished soon, I couldn't understand why she kept these flowers a secret. It didn't make any sense anymore. I struggled to connect art references to the story, because at that point I didn't even know Penny's background, that she has some art historian background. Um, I was waiting for the world building for more descriptions of how this collapsed world still functions. Because we see the shortage of water and rationing of it, uh, climate refugees and crumbling estate. But at the same time, we see first, car first class compartments in a train and huge domes protecting parts of the city and functioning internet. That was the first thing I expected to hear more about. 
speculation on how this near future looks like. We are shown that Penny is using a pile of books as a table, that there is a crack in the wall on, in the library, and that everything is falling apart, yet we don't really talk about it, except that we know that soon they will have to leave this house because it's going to be demolished. And this process of getting ready and leaving took them seven months, and actually the whole book. In parallel with this book, I was also listening to another book in Russian. It was another dystopian book, Tunnel, and it's written by Jana Wagner. And it imagines a situation when something happens outside in the world and a bunch of people in their cars get stuck in the tunnel behind the nuclear protected doors. Maybe that's another reason why I was looking for more world building in the landscapes. It made me question what we would all do when the world collapses, when money would have no value anymore, and all you can rely on would be your other skills. What kind of skills would be helpful in that case? We were bombarded with the names like Alex, Miranda, Carlos, Celia, Aidan, Julian, but nothing was really explained about them. Most of them just stayed as shadows throughout the whole book. Even though Aiden lives in the same estate and probably sleeps with Penny at the same bed, we barely see him throughout the whole book. From a few replicas that we hear from Aiden, I marked him as the most logical and sane person in the, this whole story. He's the one who's actually preparing to move on. He's building house on wheels and he's not trying to stalk anybody else in the house. How was this estate run by Aiden's father or Julian's father, that a huge collection that they had wasn't catalogued. Why Penny needs to catalog it now? What's the point of spending emergency fund on exterminating termites if you are about to demolish the whole house? Why Penny is still in this house if her trauma was so painful? Why didn't she leave and start fresh elsewhere, away from this family? I had a lot of questions like that while reading. Some seemed big to me, like decision to come back to this house, but they weren't really properly explained. At some point we read a story about how back in the day people treated art as assets. Only some appreciated it for its content, like this old woman that we hear the story about. And it made me think about how easily we turn things into symbols, assets and commodity how capitalistic mindset often wins. But the real cost of beauty is somebody's broken life. I believe that to paint that violent scene, something must have inspired the painter. Even if it's a mythical story, the roots of it are real. There was a moment when I thought that I finally figured out, or at least understood a little, why all those art references are there. That's how Penny's brain functions. She's an art historian, and it's some kind of professional deformation. If I were asked something, I'd be giving examples from software development or my dancing experiences. Then I was pissed off by the, some special version of Gretin dish. I googled the name, and it says that you need a special potato from some French region. And how did you get that luxury? If you barely have money for repairs. All this time we were jumping from a very zoomed in picture of how the estate is run into a bigger scale of the disaster. And sometimes it felt too big of a jump, too sudden of a jump, which I didn't like. The narration of the book is not linear, so I'm not sure if it's a plus or a minus. From one side, it helps to pull together those 22 years that Penny and Julian didn't see each other. It feels much shorter, like it was something recent. From another side, it was confusing to understand the timeline of the art essays. I saw from my notes that I had an idea that maybe those essays are written after the event, but it was just a glimpse of an idea, so there was no real confirmation to that until later in the book. From the positive, since I mentioned a lot of stuff that I didn't like, I think I should 
also compensated with a bit positive bits. I couldn't agree more with the few ideas that I saw in the book. So first one was about people and that we think that we are good at forcing the nature to be our way by creating the artificial hills and planting some exotic plants in the places they don't belong. The second one is about reusing the materials. In some, at some point we see Aiden when he's building house on wheels, reusing some materials from the estate. And that not only helps with the reusing the materials and instead of producing new ones, but I think it also gives some sentimental touch to it. That you lived with those, I don't know, walls, and now you have the same wooden walls in your house on wheels. So it's a slight reminder of the estate. Especially now that it's going to be demolished, it will be probably the only thing that would remind about the old house. Julian's character was shown as selfish, spoiled, rich, narcissistic and even violent. Yet one moment in the book hinted that he had some kind of childhood trauma as a justification of his character and actions. I don't think that it justifies enough, but well... We can also see that he's not a pure evil, that something affected him in the first place as well. Well, nothing gets clear at the end, and I don't even believe that Penny wrote everything down and got healed. The world didn't collapse still, the house is still not demolished, and the story of the assault is told from Penny's state afterwards. Julian never arrived at the house, uh, we don't see their meeting, so what did we read 200 pages about? I will check. 212, if I'm right. Yes, 212 pages. I'll show you again. I like the edition. I think landscapes ambitiously touched many hot topics like climate disaster, art criticism, trauma, feminism, veganism, parent-child relationship. But it feels like a half-baked mix rather than a developed narrative. I would have preferred those critical essays as a separate non-fiction book. I don't know, some art criticism on violent art or something like that. With a good reference list like we got here, but as a separate book, not mixed with the story. I hope I didn't forget any points that I wanted to mention. If I'll remember something while editing, I'll add it to the description. And I'm tired of this book, so I'm gonna make this video and I'll be done with it. I'm ready to move on. I don't have much curiosity to check other books of this author, but I think I'm still curious to check other books of $2 Press. So if you read something of this publisher and you liked it, please recommend it to me in the comments. That was it for today. Thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you in the next videos. Bye.